I'm here at your uh, analyst day. It's great to be here. First one in a long time. You're talking about the opportunity, the long-term opportunity, especially when it comes to 5G. I, I believe you said the serviceable, uh, ab available opportunity, which is kind of like total addressable market, is growing from $65 billion to $100 billion. Explain. That's right. It goes from $65 billion in 19 to uh, $100 billion in 2022. So in really three years, it grows a dramatic amount. It just gives you the sense of how important 5G will be to Qualcomm's business. By the way, I also gave a number that said the total amount of economic uh, impact of 5G in 2035 is going to be $13.2 trillion. So 5G is going to be an important thing. Uh, you know, Qualcomm really at this point does not have an opportunity problem. Okay. I, I want to understand more about that because for, for a long time, We've been talking about lots of things besides the technology and the product. Broadcom tried right. to take you guys over. You guys tried to uh, take out NXP, but regulatory uh, issues, China kind of got in the way. Now the argument is we can talk about the technology again. What is it about 5G that really is going to be the opportunity? How much of it is you having more IP per phone that's going to bring in more profit? How much of it is entirely new areas this is going to get you into? You should think of it in two phases. First phase is essentially we make more money out of the existing cellular business just because it's going to 5G. And it's going to go for five, to 5G over the next decade. We basically make, we sell more expensive products and we get a bigger portion of the phone bomb in the products that we sell. Mm -hmm. then bill of materials? Bill of materials. Exactly. I don't want people to think you were saying B-O-M-B. -B. It's a fun... <laughs> that's right, the bill, yeah, the bill right. of materials. Yeah. So, um, and then in addition, the technology that's required in order to be successful in that market is also very important in other markets that are now taking on 5G. Auto is the best first example of that, but there are many other behind it. And so we essentially have the ability to take the R&D that we're producing in the smartphone space and leverage it multiple times for the benefit of the shareholders. Now, based on the way you see 5G ramping now, when are investors going to start to feel that benefit of you having more IP in these devices? Well, you're really going to see it over the next two quarters for us and actually through the next year. If you look at our last earnings call, we essentially gave, I think, a strong guide for our licensing business, which it kind of sits as a proxy for really the Christmas season selling. And then we said, uh, we kind of gave a soft indication of what we thought the, the March quarter would be, which essentially said, you're going to see 5G start impacting our product business at that time. And it'll come in two phases during the calendar year, one at the beginning of the year, and then another one in the second half of the year when some flagship launches uh, launch in both places. Let's talk about your automotive business. You're going to give some more detail about that here. You haven't given it yet, but I'm going to try to tease it out. You said that uh, that business is growing to about $6.5 billion pipeline uh, so far. What is that? Is that entertainment inside the car? Is that driver assistance technology? And what's going to drive growth for you? It's really uh, currently in the business. It's the telematics or the, or the, the equipment that connects the, the car to the Internet. And then the infotainment, which is the, you know, the, the, everything you see in the dashboard or in the infotainment side, all of that is actually what Qualcomm supplies today. Very highly leveraged from our smartphone business. Big opportunity. We've talked about $6.5 billion of design pipeline. We're going to break that out to this afternoon uh, later on when the CFO speaks. He'll talk about how that breaks down kind of in a yearly basis. And I think what people will conclude is what we've concluded, which is this is already a business at scale. It compares favorably to our competitors, and we think it's going to grow very nicely for us over the next several years. Is the growth model clear? That I was talking to some of your folks about this, about whether the automakers are going to buy based on the technology that's already available or whether they're going to buy to future-proof and kind of where the opportunity for Qualcomm sits. Is it in you guys sort of having the data and owning the service going forward and, and making profit, maybe selling to the OEMs yep. at a 4G price, but having 5G in there? How, how do you work it? It, it actually just sell. We, we do. It's, it's fairly basic, actually. It's fairly straightforward. We sell uh, to the automobile uh, manufacturers because they have such a, de a long design win pipeline. Actually, the, the, we, we know much of our forecast is secured already by design wins. Um, there's not a kind of a fancy pricing model. It's actually we get we get you know, you know, pricing for value, so it, it works pretty well. There is an opportunity down the road, I think, for people to monetize some of the data that comes off the, um, the you know, the, the, the car. 
But that's really not what we're, we're talking about here. We also uh, will give and have given some indications that we're entering into the ADAS market, into the computing and some of the algorithms around ADAS. We think that's... Driver assistance? That's correct. And so that's a, that's a really good kind of third step in our auto strategy, which is, which is going to be, uh, I think, a good earner for us. When I visited your campus a couple weeks ago, thanks for having me, by the way, I was looking at a lot of the 5G technologies that you guys are ramping up. Factory technology was one of those pieces, being able to do flexible manufacturing. It should enable a lot more customization. But the sense I'm getting is that that's a couple years away because of design cycles, because of standards that need to be put in place. So give a sense of how 5G will ramp. How long is it going to be before you're really firing on all cylinders as far as these businesses that we're talking about being a part of the 5G ecosystem really buying? Well, I think you could think of it in two phases. One is a handset phase, and the second one is a phase related to industries using 5G to accelerate digitization. Now, lucky for us, the handset phase, which is the first one, is probably the largest market, and it will instantly happen, and it will happen over the next decade, starting next calendar year, so in you know, a month. Mm. Uh, you'll start to see that in the, in the results of our business. But then you're going to see that kind of play out over a long period of time as, as the handset market goes. Now, then you go into these adjacent markets, the digitization, and you mentioned industrial. So what you're seeing, they're, they're requiring the second rev of 5G. There are multiple revs of the standard. Okay. First one's based on handsets. The second one is really about all the features to make high reliable factories. We talked a little bit in the past about healthcare, gaming, those things. There are special features that we have put into the standard which will come out in a second, third, and fourth wave over the next decade. Okay. It's that second, that second wave which is really about the other industries besides the handset. Let's talk about legal, regulatory. The FTC uh, issue is still sort of hanging over your head a bit. It's supposed to be back in court in January or at least early 2020, I believe. How confident are you that you kind of got that issue contained and, and can give yep. Wall Street here a, a pretty clear idea of the growth that's coming? Well, I think we feel very confident in how we argue. And, of course, we were buoyed by the uh, filings, particularly by the DOJ, which made a very strong filing. Uh, but probably most importantly was we got the stay. So we got a stay, which essentially allowed us to continue to operate our business. And that was very good for us. Um, and, and in the meantime, we've been signing up a lot of anchor agreements. So we, when we think of our licensing business, we tend to think of it now as kind of a stable earner. Mm. You know? and, um, and, of course, we're using that to, uh, to invest in R&D. We're doing a lot of capital return based off of it. But, but we feel like the hard part of our business is behind us. We still have legal risk, but the hard part, we think, is behind us. Okay. Now, finally, give, give me your sense of the macro economy that you're operating in right now. Uh, Apple gave some numbers and some projections that, that surprised some people, uh, particularly when it comes to China. Uh, but, but overall, it, I'm sure it didn't hurt you guys. Is there anything that's constraining you, particularly when it comes to this trade war between the U.S. and China? Not so much. If you look, of course, our, our view of the market is so focused or so um, concentrated by the technology markets that we work in. So, for example, our, our outlook is so dominated by the ramp of 5G, which is happening in a big way. So it, it tends, we tend to be a little bit more isolated from the macro picture that other people see. Similarly, with, even with the trade discussions, because we have such a small business, really, with Huawei, we tend to see uh, less impact, direct impact from the trade discussions. It, it's a benefit of having a broader customer base and, and broad geographical um, exposure at the time when the technology that we lead in is so important. Any closer to getting Huawei to pay you? No, no closer. <laughs> All right. Steve Mollenkopf, CEO of Qualcomm.